Okay, and the next presentation is from the Dr. Engineer Aníbal Uriel Pacheco Sánchez. Aníbal Pacheco received the Doctor Engineer degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the Technisch Universität Dresden Chair for Electron Device and Integrate Circuits, Germany in 2019, and the Master Science degree in Telecommunication Engineering and Bachelor Engineering degree in Telecommunication and Electronics from the National Polytechnic Institute, Mexico in 2011 and 2009, respectively. So in April 29, he worked as a postdoctoral research in the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, Spain. His present research interests involve the characterization, parameter extraction, compact and numerical modeling of emerging transistor technologies, statics and dynamical perform dynamic performance with channel of one and two dimension. In 2007, he was a visiting scholar in Texas A&M University in U USA in the Analog and Mixed Signals Center. From 2010 to 2011, he was a research assistant in the graduate studies and research section, CEPI Telecom of the Electrical and Mechanical Engineering Superior School, uh, the CIME, IPN. From 2011 to 2012, he lectured course in Telecommunication Engineering Academic in CIME Mexico. From 2017 to 29, he worked as a research associate in the TU Dresden, Germany. He has supervised two visiting scholars from IPN Mexico in TU Dresden and in the Autonomous University of Barcelona in 2018 and 2019, respectively. During his time as PhD research associate, he was a guest researcher in the device modeling group in the Center of Advanced, Advancing Electronics Dresden, where he worked towards the development of RAF carbon nanotube electronics. He supervised three bachelor theses and two master theses from TU Dresden student. Current, currently, he also collaborated with CEPI Telecom and IPN as an ex external research where he has co-supervisor to master thesis and tier one to be finished in early 2021. Dr. Pacheco has authored and co-authored 16 papers and peer review journal and 13 papers in referee conference proceeding. He has been invited a speaker in the Cathedra Eugenio Mendez de Curro in 2017 and 29. Dr. Pacheco? Yes, I'm here. Yes, you yeah. have the microphone. You had 13 minutes for the presentation. And after that, we'll have 15 minutes for question, please. OK, you can, can you see my slides this? already? Yeah. Can you see my screen already? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this nice presentation. Um, so after looking at the title of my talk in the flyer, I realized that I was being a little bit too ambitious. So I'm not a technology guy. I'm, I'm not telling you exactly how to build an RF emerging transistor. I'm more an RF device modeling and characterization researcher. And I just want to share with you uh, the findings of uh, experimental and theoretical study of crabs during these last years in Dresden and Barcelona. Before starting with the technical stuff, I would like to give special thanks to, organizing, to the organizing committee of this event, um, to all the speakers who took, to, who took their time to prepare the slides and share all the present research they are developing in different parts of the world. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. 
And finally, but not least, I would like to thank all the colleagues I have, I have collaborated with um, to achieve this experience in traps in one dimensional and two dimensional fets that I'm going to share with you now. So I started this study at Teu uh, Dresden, Professor Michael Schroeder, uh, in which also I collaborated with some people in NABLAV to perform some uh, measurements there. And uh, during the last couple of years, uh, I expanded this study with the group of Professor David Jimenez at uh, UAB, uh, with uh, my colleagues, uh, Nicolas Mavredakis and Pedro Feijó, who also gave some talks yesterday, with the collaboration of uh, the group from Henry Happy at the University of Lille. So thanks all of you. This is the technical agenda of my talk. I would start giving you the state of the art of the RF emerging transistor technologies, which I will identify here as one dimensional FETs and two dimensional FETs, depending on the dimension of the channel. So then I will mention some devices and challenges, that, device issues and challenges that we find in these devices. Um, what is stopping them to uh, produce reliable RF applications, or at least some of the issues, maybe not all of them. Then I will uh, give you a general overview through experimental results of the TRAMP's, TRAPS impact on the device performance on DC and especially on RF um, uh, scenarios. Uh, I will talk a little bit about modeling of traps, how to deal with trap affected devices nowadays, because we can live with them. Um, yeah, then I summarize my talk later. So let's define the RF emerging transistor technologies that we are going to talk about in this uh, presentation. What I call one dimensional uh, field effect transistors consist of carbon nanotube field effect transistors and nanowire uh, FETs. So maybe uh, Gather can see now why I asked regarding the vertical um, nanowire FETs. Anyway, uh, CNT FETs, and the first on the, on the top part of the slide, um, they are built with parallel carbon nanotubes in the channel, which diameter can be of one or two nanometers, and the length of them depends on the technology. It, it can be uh, produced um, in, a, in a way that it's so short as six nanometers or even a few micrometers. So it has been claimed that uh, there is an inherent one-dimensional transport in these uh, materials. So you have a reduced scattering probability within the channel of these devices. And theoretically, it has been predicted a linearity in, at a device level, which is quite important in RF systems. Um, uh, RF CNT FETs are generally built with multitude channel, just so you can reduce the output impedance with a top gate architecture and a high K oxide uh, separating the channel from the gate. Um, nanowire field effect transistors, on the other hand, uh, well, they resemble somehow the CMT FETs, but uh, the nanowires are not hollow cylinders, are CMTs, they are bulk cylinders. And the nanometers of these nanowires are, are short, but not as short as nanotubes. So they are around six to 20 nanometers, like the shortest I have seen. Um, one dimensional or quasi ballistic transport is also predicted for these. Um, the RF devices that I have seen in this nanowire technology correspond to three, five multi wire channel. <clears throat> In, the, in a way that the channel is vertical. That's, that was my second question to gather, because in the literature, I have found experimental results for this kind of devices. Um, also, they need a high permittivity oxide to separate the channel uh, from the gate. Now, when we talk about two-dimensional uh, FETs, we uh, refer to devices who, uh, which have like uh, 2D materials as a channel. 
The 2D materials have a strong uh, longitudinal covalent bounds and weak perpendicular van der Waals bounds, so they are quite attractive to be used as a channel in, 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 in FET devices. There are plenty of 2D materials nowadays being researched. They can be used as an insulator, as semiconductors, metals, or semi-metals. But particularly for this talk, we focus on the two-dimensional materials that have been used or have been experimentally proven to work in the RF regime, namely graphene FETs, molybdenum FETs, and black phosphorus FETs. They have an ultra-thin channel. They have also a multi-finger top gate structure of the one shown here. However, I have to say that our colleagues from Lille have demonstrated back gate structures suitable for RF performance as well. And they are candidates uh, to be built over bulk or flexible substrates. So they are quite interesting also for flexible electronics. And another, well, one characteristic that they share with the other devices we have shown is that they need a high permittivity oxide. Now, I would love to give you more details about all these devices, but uh, don't take me wrong, you can, you can, you can, you can read them in, in books or papers. And what I wanted to show you is um, these two plots. These two plots uh, gathered the experimental results of fabricated devices from the different technologies I just mentioned you. Uh, we, have, we have here the extrinsic transit frequency over channel length and the maximum oscillation frequency in an extrinsic uh, manner uh, over the channel length for these different technologies. The extrinsic figures of merits are the ones that are interesting for circuit applications, because when you build these devices in a monolithic way, all the parasitic contributions that are gonna be there are the extrinsic ones. So the intrinsic give you a um, clear idea of the material capabilities, but they are not translated directly into RF applications. So please always have a look at the extrinsic transit frequency and maximum oscillation frequency. Okay. Now, the nanowire fits. In this case, I have, I have found uh, these outstanding results for a scaled non, uh, three, five nanowire FETs. So they show an FT larger than 200 gigahertz and an Fmax also in the 100 regime of gigahertz. So, but uh, I have not found so many results of them, so I don't know what's the status of the scalability of this technology. And I have not found either wafer scale reproducibility, because if we would like to have reproducible circuit applications, we need this kind of technology. So, uh, so I, don't, I don't know if they are uh, like results that are gonna be practical for, for circuits or not. So I put like a, a question mark here. Modidemium diesel five feds appear here in the middle of the plots and they show like good scalability trend. However, they don't provide higher FTs, larger, uh, higher than 10 gigahertz, and the Fmax are also around that number. So uh, they are showing quite discrete results, not so good. BP feds, despite their uh, early stage of the technology, so people started to look at them and the, and the RF uh, capabilities like six years ago, they have shown already results similar to molybdenum, yeah, but uh, with a little bit larger channel length. So let's give them a little bit more of time and I'm sure uh, all these points here are gonna move to the central part of the plots. And GFETs and CNTFETs are, without doubt, the champions in these technologies if we consider scalability and wafer scale reproducibility. Some proof of concept devices have already achieved uh, 100 gigahertz for these technologies here. So they are our candidates. What about uh, circuit applications with these technologies? 
Again, this is these are results of uh, literature research I have done for my PhD thesis. I have updated it. And if I have not included results from your uh, technology, so sorry, please send me the results and I can include them here. If we have a look on a uh, single stay arrow, ampli arrow amplifiers, we see here some results for GFETs and CNTFETs. No RF amplifiers have been built with other technology, and we can achieve at least 10 gigahertz with GFETs and a few gigahertz with CNTFETs. So there have been demonstrations also of mixers and with more technologies, not only CNTFETs and uh, GFETs, but also with black phosphorus and molybdenum transistors. And actually, the upconverted frequency with CNTFETs can reach uh, around 50 gigahertz, so it's quite promising as well. In the multipliers case, we only found uh, CNTFETs and GFETs again results, and in the oscillators, only CNTFET based circuits have been demonstrated. So all of them are between one and let's put it in 40 gigahertz. So I think they are suitable for RF. There are still some issues to be solved, but uh, they are working at this stage of the technology level. So the RF technologies with more applications uh, found in the literature, again, experimental results only are GFET and CNTFET. There are some uh, ways to improve the performance and some approaches to improve it at an integrated circuit level are two, or at least I know two. Uh, it has been proposed to build an all carbon-based uh, system on chip, either of graphene or CNT, or both of them. Or you can also have hybrid solutions. Hybrid solutions means that you have an emerging technology boosted or supported by silicon technology. They have been proven that this work already for digital applications in computers based on CNTFETs and silicon technology. And there are some proposals as well with graphene and silicon CMOS technology. So there are, there, there, there are good options for these technologies yet. Now let's talk about some device issues and challenges that will affect our RF performance in these devices. Um, uh, let me see if I can move this. Yeah, sorry, it was a disturbing me. Uh, okay, now let's talk about uh, contacts and self-heating first. Let's focus our attention here, please, in this sketch of the cross-section of a 1D or 2D FET, whatever you want. You have here the channel in red, the high permittivity oxide separating the gate and the channel, which is quite important for our study. And below it, I have draw the conduction band diagram at different bias points. This is the conduction band within the channel of the device in one dimension. And um, this is a sketch of the intrinsic compact model of the transistor here. We can identify immediately, immediately two um, phenomena that are going to affect our RF performance. First of all, these resistances here, which are called the contact resistances, are due to the uh, difference between the energy level at the contacts, injecting contacts, and the energy level at the channel here. You have a short key barrier like uh, appearing uh, uh, barrier height here, and in addition to this, the interfacial layers also play a role and put some value on RC. So normally RC in these devices is quite high. And we, there are several papers showing the, the RF performance degradation of RC. Uh, one of them is by us. <laughs> so you can see the difference between considering RC or not considering RC in the intrinsic part of the channel is around 170 gigahertz for the for the for, for a giga for, for a GFET. And as Pedro talked about yesterday, also self-heating play a role. So the drain current, the transport here in the channel, depends on several factors. And one of them is the temperature. So uh, self-heating of the device can affect also your RF performance. So for example, here you can obtain um, 
uh, higher values of the maximum oscillation frequency if you don't if you uh, lower the self heating as demonstrated by this dashed line. So this is a study by Pedro and some of these results were presented yesterday. So I just wanted to mention that uh, these, these phenomena are important in, 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 in these devices. But my main discussion here is around traps because normally trap effects are overlooked in the RF performance of these devices. So let's define traps. Traps, it's a material or energetic dependent imperfection in the channel or its surroundings able to capture and release carriers at a certain time. That's important as well. So again, we have the cross section of our device here. Below it, I have uh, draw the, again, the conduction band diagram, but just uh, at one bias point. This energy conduction band depends among other factors on the channel potential, which I draw here below. So this is important for my next discussion. We can identify different trap centers within our, within our device. First, we have imperfections in the channel and the interfaces. Uh, we have also uh, oxide defects close to the channel, and we have deep oxide defects. All of them have different time constants to capture and to emit uh, carriers. <laughs> and they differ between technologies as well. So let's see what happens when you have traps here. They shield the channel potential. How they shield it? This is uh, a, a, a moment in which these traps here, sorry, here is the zoom of this region of the channel below the gate. And here the traps are uh, empty. So all the field, line, field lines coming from the gate are affecting directly the channel potential. However, at some point, then the traps are filled with carriers here. So the field lines are not arriving directly to the channel potential. So you have an affected channel potential here. If you have uh, traps within uh, this oxide, or trap, uh, traps filled within this oxide, and uh, your gate control is reduced, so the current transport conditions have changed. This is uh, resulting in uh, a bias point shift. So for example, your threshold voltage is shifted. So before showing some experimental results, uh, including these effects that I just mentioned, let me present you some device characterization techniques that I am going to mention along this, the next slides. First of all, we have the standard staircase non-pulse measurement technique. In this case, to apply a, in a staircase-like scenario, the voltage signals. So you apply first, for example, one pole, then you go to 1.5 and so on. The, the current is measured at the end of the poles. However, you can see that the, if the current is affected by traps, it's going to be diminished. And at some point, of course, there are going to be a steady-like state, but it could be that it is not reached by this time step. And if it is not reached, then this trap state would affect the next one and the next one and so on. And that results in a, in a trap affected behavior. If you, if you characterize your devices with this, with this scheme, the measurement setup for this is not challenging at all. And it's useful to give you an idea uh, of the initial conditions of your devices. Again, non uh, another non-pulse technique, but a little bit more reliable in terms of trap reduced performance in, is an opposing sweep technique. So you kind of erase the measurement history. So you uh, counter the charging at one point with the uncharging of the traps at the other step by applying uh, consecutive voltage signals with similar magnitude but different size. This can give you a uh, trap reduced uh, performance of your device. And the most accurate characterization technique are pulse measurements. So this resembles like PWM, for example, and it depends on different factors, on the duration of the pulse, on the frequency of the pulse, and also the pulse width. Um, this can give you um, um, trap reduced performance, like more accurate than this one. 
and it is useful for precise characterization of your devices. So let's see the trap impact on real devices. You can, uh, or people is looking at hysteresis just to see if their device is affected or not. Hysteresis is basically just an operating point drift. Let's have a look at this plot, this transfer characteristic of a CNT FET that uh, I have measured like five years ago or so. And the lines represent non pulse measurements, and the symbols represent. Uh, um, opposing sweep measurements. So you can see that in the non-pulse measurements, you have a hysteresis voltage window here. So that means that your traps are starting to be filled when you apply a four bar sweep, when you start from minus two to two. And at some point, you want to test what happens if you apply a backward sweep from two to minus two. So the traps are filled here they continue to be filled at the change of the sweep direction. That's the reason why the drain current at the backward sweep is lower than the drain current at the forward sweep. But at some point, that changes. And that changes, that change means that you have uh, your traps already emitting at this bias point and after a certain time. You can see that at high uh, drain voltages, even with the uh, opposing sweep, you can see a little bit of hysteresis. So, uh, traps impact more at higher fields. You can always say that if you don't have hysteresis width, then you don't have traps. Let's have a look at this GFET that we measured in March or February um, in our lab in at UAV. And you can say we, it, this was with non pulse measurements. So, you can say, okay, we don't have hysteresis with you. We don't have a difference between forward and backward sweep. Yeah, okay. But let's have a look at the second order functions of the drain current. If we check then the output conductance, you have quite a difference there. So having a small hysteresis width is not always a good indicator that you have a trap reduced behavior. Now, the a steady or non-steady device response, yeah, because uh, sometimes you, you 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 apply pulse for for more than 100 seconds and you don't see a steady response, depends on the capture and emission time of the of the traps. So that's important. There are two important factors that you need to be considered to, to consider. The measurement history also affects traps, and I have seen this in at least in GFET uh, literature. In GFET literature, they always say you apply a pulse, and uh, after some minutes or after some seconds, you uh, you will have a steady state. So you can measure your your trap free uh, performance over there. However, it's it it not only depends on how long the pulse is. It also depends on the non quiescent. Uh, conditions here, so on the on the charging or pre-charging of your device, of your of your char of your traps here, as I show here, the hysteresis window depends on the dot cycle and on the pulse width that you are applying. So not only on this, but also on the non-quiescent conditions. Excuse so me, this, Peter, you have yeah, five minutes. Yeah, thank you. And the steady conditions differ, differ between technologies. So you can find this kind of behavior similarly in GFETs, in molybdenum, and um, black phosphor effects. Uh, uh, also between different technology uh, generations, you can have this kind of, 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 of effect. As I said, the trapping processes depend on both quiescent and non-quiescent conditions. We have found out this or demonstrated this with a student back in, in Dresden. And we see first here the blue curve, it's non-pulse measurements, no, sorry, staircase measurements, uh, opposing sweep uh, characterization, sorry. And then we apply a different non-quiescent condition my, from zero volts to minus two volts. That gives us the red curve here. The hysteresis windows is quite short. However, when we change not only the, the, the pre-charging condition, but also the pulse width, then we obtain our expected trap reduced performance. So everything plays a role here. 
um, we need to know uh, the time constant of our uh, capture and emitting processes. So how this impact the RF performance? You can say because I have only shown you DC uh, results, but whenever you are characterizing uh, RF response of these active devices, you need this bias T. Bias T is just a splitter, so it splits the DC signal that it is affected by traps and the RF signal. They are mounted together. So, okay, people say RF signal is not affected by traps because they are faster than that. Yeah, I agree on that if you have a, uh, a passive device, but if you have an active device, the bias shift that I showed you before, it's gonna affect your measurement. How they affect the apparent linearity? So apparent linearity is basically obtaining a pure signal at the end of, uh, of your device, at the output of your device. If you don't have an, uh, a, good, a good linearity, then you have some products and that's gonna consume you power. That's critical for LNA, PA, and mixers. And there is, there are some studies saying that inherent linearity is possible in carbon nanotubes and graphene field effect transistors. I have studied this one, the first one, but not the second one. So uh, and I put here really because uh, I'm not sure if this is really happening. I explain you why. So the, the apparent linearity can be uh, monitored by a constant GM. So people are saying, for example, in CNT FETs that you have a, a, a constant GM, then you have a good linearity there. These are results with non-pulse measurements. However, when you measure the same device with pulses, then this apparent linearity disappears. That's because the AC response of consecutive, consecutive non-pulses corresponds to the same internal bias point because of the shielding we talked before. So this apparent linearity cannot be exploited in zero weights at all. <clears throat> The actual linearity only reveal, it's only revealed with trap reduced characterization. So always apply this kind of characterization when you are talking about RF performance as well. Let's go back to our study on graphene. They show here the IAPP3 measured and they show the one model and they don't agree at all. And they actually accept that they have not included traps. So they are accepting that they have traps, but they don't compare them. They don't compare the IP3. So uh, I'm not saying that it is wrong, but I put a question mark on this. Okay, you can you can prove it if you model uh, the traps in GFETs. And that's uh, part of uh, my next step in the work. So how the traps impact the high frequency uh, performance of different devices is shown here. Uh, the transit and maximum oscillation frequency of CNT FETs, it's altered by traps. This, the, the solid line is with non-pulse measurements, the other with pulse measurements. You can see a difference not only in bias, but also in magnitude in both cases. The same has been shown for GFETs and also for vertical nanowires. So all these that have high K oxide, including traps, they uh, show this uh, non-optimal behavior. What about the trap modeling? This is in my last min minute, so you need to to model it because the traps are everywhere, especially in warfare scale processes. It helps you to, to evaluate your technology and understand experimental observation. And for these early applications, we need this modeling. And I show you next quickly the approaches that we're using to model these uh, traps. The first one is to include the trap effect in the charge definition and this nice work by Fran, our colleague at UAB and some colleagues at Granada, they include the, the trap modeling here in the charge definition. And we took this idea and apply it to the devices we measure from Lille. And we obtain a good model that fits both the non-pulse measurements and pulse measurements here. And we are able also to produce for the first time a direct, a trap affected direct voltage in, in GFETs uh, as a function of BDS here for, for, for non-pulse and pulse measurements. We also obtain the trap density with this study. So this model is quite useful for explaining this. And if you include the, a module in your compact models, you can actually reproduce pretty well the performance of non-pulse and pulse measurements as we shown here in CNT-FEDS. 
and we revealed that the apparent linearity reported before, at least for CMT effects, was just um, a shielded potential, so an effect of the traps. So the, actually, I wanted to do the same for GFETs in my uh, next step of the work. Uh, with, uh, I, I just mentioned this, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm over time. Um, there are some techniques to characterize the capture and emission processes available in the literature, but they are, they are suitable for devices which have a bulk contact. In this one dimension or two dimension, you don't have a bulk contact. So you need to propose different approaches. And that's what we have proposed here in this paper that it is on their uh, review right now. I wanted to show you the real results, but okay, I show you the models. So actually these are monitoring results, uh, but we have rep uh, obtained for the first time both trap capture and trap emission processes in CNTFETs, and these characterization can be used in other uh, emerging devices. I finished my talk, how to live with traps? Can we, can we avoid them? From, there are some solutions from the technology groups they can passivate their devices, encapsulate their devices, uh, propose different outsides, but there is a long way for a trap-free RF uh, emerging device. From the characterization point of view, you can adequate your conditions to reduce the trap impact, and you can already exploit these biasing conditions, for example, in high data rate communications with pulse-based modulation schemes. The wrap up of my, device, of my <laughs> talk is that uh, I hope I convince you by showing experimental data that 1D and 2D FETs are suitable for high frequency applications. And there are traps still in devices and wafer scale technology of, uh, of these uh, emerging uh, nanotransistors. The standard measurements show a linearity which cannot be exploited in RF circuits. The opposing sweep and pulse measurements can reveal measured trap behavior. But the hysteresis width is not the best indicator that you have a trap reduced behavior. Trapping animation time constants are required to get a steady state condition. Quiescent and non quiescent conditions are important, not only holding time, please. And it can be useful for correct evaluation. Um, we need compact model for early applications. Technical, technological solutions are, we are are going to be available soon, and we can exploit the trap reduced biasing condition at this stage of the technology if we apply the correct uh, pulses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacheco Sanchez. Great presentation. Now we'll have some questions. And Dr. Eloy, if you have one question. Uh Thank you, Dr. Fontes. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Pacheco, thanks for this uh, presentation. There is a lot of uh, uh, measurements and data. It's quite normal to take more time than predicted. So I have just a question um, regarding the strategies to avoid the apparition of, of these traps can you detail a little bit more these uh, techniques, please? Yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> here, for example. So uh, let's go to the pulse measurement scheme. So basically, during this time, this non quiescent time, you are uh, maybe applying a voltage in which your traps are going to be, um, so the carriers in the traps are going to be released. So this is to empty your traps, for example. And then you apply a short pulse that it is shorter than the capture and emission time, and you measure uh, your response at the end of this short pulse. So you can, sure, you can be sure that this is a trap-free behavior or trap-reduced behavior, because there are always going to be traps in there. And the other option, and this is quite challenging actually to, to have in a laboratory, especially in RF characterization. For RF characterization, actually you can uh, get use of this opposing pulse technique because you just need your normal SMU, your bias T's and your VNA. And in your SMU, you apply opposing pulses. And basically the previous pulse um, not 
unfills the traps, but erases the measurement history you had before. So basically, put, it puts the state of your traps at the same level. That's the reason why hysteresis is reducing. So that, those are the characterization techniques, and that's why I'm saying you can get advantage of this because those seem like uh, telecommunications modulation schemes. And there are already some demonstration of QAM and PSK uh, systems with graphene by applying this kind of uh, modulation schemes. Okay, thank you. And what about uh, the slide entitled uh, Living Without um, Traps? Again, can you detail a little bit more about uh, this slide, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so there, are, there is a work that appeared last year here in Nature Electronics showing that you can produce molybdenum diesel 5 fats uh, with a back gate oxide made out of uh, calcium and fluoride. So basically, this lowers the defects at the interface between your two-dimensional channel and your back gate oxide, which is quite promising. And I have seen the results. There is no stereotype at all here. And, and this is something that we um, can exploit if and only if this technology, this fluoride calcium is produced also for top gate uh, architectures because those are the most suitable architectures for high frequency uh, devices. So if we have already a top gate architecture and you passivate or encapsulate your channel, you can reduce also the traps at the interface, but the traps at the oxide are still an issue over there. So I'm not an expert on technology. I'm just saying that there are some solutions. And um, I mean, we have investigated this maybe in a time in the last 10 years. So let's give them time from the technological point of view. From the characterization point of view, you can always characterize the adequate conditions at which your poles will give you trap-free performance. You can provide this information along with your compound model to the circuit designer and tell him, use this device in this circuit with these biasing conditions. So they can take advantage of the really impressive properties of the devices and not trap-affected properties. Uh, yeah, that's what I can say uh, besides the high data rate communication systems that I already mentioned. Okay, thank you so much. Well, uh, uh, thank you. We have one to... question. Excellent presentation. Go thank ahead, you. Dr. Fontes. Yes, we have one question from the chat from Dr. Dark Bandy. In the slide number 24, just considering RC to capture traps behavior and the device lead to a compact model or numerical model? Thank you. This is in a compact model. So basically you have your uh, compact model that I show here, and you have a module, a different module for traps, not in numerical device simulation, at a compact model already. So you can actually characterize your capture time by one RC network and your emission time by, by, the, by, by a second one. And you can have several RC networks depending on uh, the trap behavior you see. So for example, maybe you just don't have one capture time constant, maybe you have two. And that's what uh, we have actually obtained here with Christoph uh, before, sorry. Anyway, you can produce different RC networks and with those RC networks, you can obtain a given BTR, a, 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 a trap-related voltage that's going to be uh, injected into a node here in your compact model and reproduce your non-pulsed uh, performance here. So uh, if you would like to, 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 to reproduce this with numerical device simulations, you can always include the, 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 the trap function 
in your continuity equation, or maybe you can also mimic this uh, um, this approach uh, by our colleagues, in which you uh, put together with the quantum capacitance and interfacial capacitance due to defects, for example. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacheco, alumni from the National Polytechnical. Uh, now we have, uh, before we pass to the next conference, uh, we have this recognition from, for the Dr. Pacheco, the National Polytechnical Institute through the Eugenio Mendez de Curro Chair, grant this recognition to Aníbal Uriel Pacheco Sánchez for your participation in the high frequency and terahertz device and circuits. Perspectives on emerging and advanced technology online seminar part two. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacheco. Thank you, it was a pleasure.